Hello, you guys. My name is Kylie, and welcome to the first episode of the Crime with Kylie podcast. Usually, I am a short-form true crime creator on TikTok and Instagram, but I've always wanted to do long-form content, especially with true crime. If you check out my past YouTube videos, there's quite a few, but they were never up to the quality that I really wanted, so we're gonna try it out today. Let me know what you guys think. Before we fully get into the case, I do want to give a trigger warning for things like sexual assault will be mentioned in this case, abuse, hate crimes, torture, and ultimately murder. This is the case of Jennifer Daugherty and the Greensburg Six. So before we fully delve into her case, let's talk about who Jennifer was. Jennifer Daugherty was born on November 8th of 1979, and her family was her mother and her stepfather. Jennifer, her mom, and stepfather lived in Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania. Jennifer has been described as sweet, kind, caring, fun, and easygoing, and she loved to go and make friends. Anyone who knew Jennifer loved being around her. Jennifer just radiated this positive and compassionate energy. Sadly, because she had some mental disabilities, sometimes her kindness and compassion was rejected and ridiculed. When Jennifer was younger and in elementary school and middle school, she struggled to keep up with her peers intellectually. So as a result, her peers would I mean, it's now considered a hate crime, but they would put gum in her hair and they would push her and they would say mean things, but that never turned Jennifer sour. She was always sweet nonetheless. Another big component to Jennifer's personality is that she was always willing to see the good in people even if the good was not there. Now, this desire to see the good in people and trust people made her a little bit naive. But despite the challenges that Jennifer faced, she always strove to be independent, and her family supported her in this. One of the things that Jennifer's parents let her do that fostered her independence and supported her was they let her take the bus to the nearby city of Greensburg. Now, at the time, in 2010, Greensburg had a population of a little less than 15,000 and was generally considered safe. If this helps paint the picture of Greensburg, it was very well known as a retirement community, so... From other cities in Pennsylvania, when people got of that age to want to retire, a very common place to move to was Greensburg. And so whenever Jennifer had a dentist appointment or a doctor's appointment or wanted to go to the community center, her mom or her stepdad would drop her off at the bus station and then she could take the bus by herself from Mount Pleasant to Greensburg. Now it was at that aforementioned community center that Jennifer thought that she made her first real group of friends. So who exactly were these new friends? Well, there was Angela, Amber, Peggy, Robert, Melvin, and Ricky. And Angela was the youngest of the six at age 17, and her boyfriend was Ricky, who was 23. Melvin Knight was 20 years old, and so was Amber, and I believe Amber was pregnant with Melvin Knight's baby. Peggy was 27 years old, and Robert was 36 years old. And they lived together in this apartment in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. So as you guys can tell, this friend group had a pretty large age range, and Jennifer was 30 years old when she met them, but mind you that Jennifer had the mental capabilities of a 12 to 14 year old. Now it was only after the murders that Amber decided to add a little more context to the situation because she apparently wanted the families and friends of Jennifer to get closure. So everything I'm about to say context wise is from Amber. So Amber said that this community center was an activity center for the mentally disabled. Her and her boyfriend Melvin Knight had just started going there after being in and out of homeless shelters for quite some time. And it was at that center that her and Melvin Knight met Jennifer. Now Amber has claimed that her and Melvin were only at the apartment that day because they needed to use a can opener so they could eat their vegetables. However, as you guys are soon going to find out, they played a significant role in the torture and death of Jennifer, so their innocence is uh, really non-existent. Now, why did the Greensburg Six want to torment Jennifer? Wasn't Jennifer their new friend? Well, yes, and they'd actually hung out with Jennifer a few days before the murder, and everything seemed great in the friend group. However, Angela was extremely jealous of Jennifer, and it didn't even have anything to do with Jennifer. So, as I mentioned earlier, Angela was dating Ricky, and Ricky was 23, and apparently, Ricky started to flirt with Jennifer, and he showed a very high interest in Jennifer, and Angela even said that she heard Ricky professing his love for Jennifer over the phone. So, this 17-year-old girl was very jealous of this 30-year-old woman with mental disabilities, all because of her 23-year-old boyfriend. Yeah, just let that sink in for a while. 
And obviously Jennifer was kind to everyone and she was a sweetheart, so I don't think Jennifer was intentionally trying to steal Angela's boyfriend or that they even had a thing. But Angela created this whole story in her head that Jennifer was the enemy and that she should confront Jennifer and do all these horrible things to Jennifer instead of confronting her boyfriend because I don't know about you guys, but if I was in a relationship and the guy was showing interest in someone else, I'd, I'd take it up with him. It has nothing to do with the other person. Anyways, Angela decided to confide in Amber, and Angela told Amber how much she didn't like Jennifer, and the two together came up with this entire plan to torture and torment Jennifer. So the two girls planned this sleepover for February 10th of 2010, and they invited Jennifer. And Jennifer was super excited to go because this was one of Jennifer's first real friend groups, so she thought, and this was one of her first real sleepovers. And what's more independent than going to a sleepover all by yourself with your adult friends? And this timing worked out really well for Jennifer because the next day on February 11th of 2010, Jennifer actually had a doctor's appointment scheduled. So she thought it was perfect. She could go to Greensburg, spend the night with her friends, and then the next day just go to her doctor's appointment before returning back home to Mount Pleasant. And now it's the day of the sleepover, February 10th of 2010, and Jennifer could not be more excited. Her mom was going to work that day, so Jennifer just wrote her mom a note saying, essentially, I love you so much, have a great day at work, and then Jennifer's stepdad drove her to the bus station, and Jennifer gave him a kiss on the cheek and said that she loved him and that she would see him tomorrow. And then she got on the bus, and sadly, that was the last time that he ever saw Jennifer. Because as soon as Jennifer arrived at her friend's apartment, all hell broke loose. Apparently, it all started by them taking Jennifer's purse away, taking her phone, her wallet, her keys, anything personal to her, and pouring liquids all over her purse. And according to Amber, Melvin and Bricky then began to beat Jennifer over the head with filled soda bottles and lemonade bottles. And out of pain, Jennifer called them a name. I don't know what name exactly, but that made Melvin well, it didn't make him, he was already doing horrible things, but that then caused Melvin to hold Jennifer up against a wall and begin to choke her. The abuse to Jennifer then went into the bathroom where both Amber and Angela started accusing Jennifer of wanting their men, and they pushed Jennifer into the towel rack before using the towel rack to beat Jennifer over the head. And I cannot begin to imagine how confused and concerned and hurt Jennifer was because Jennifer thought that they genuinely cared about her and Jennifer had no ill intentions against any of them. So I just imagine pure shock and panic with all that was happening. So another potentially important piece of information here is that apparently Angela knew Jennifer for years prior to this attack and that a few days before the sleepover, the girls were talking about it, like super happy, like everything was going to be great and it was going to be fun. And the thing is, this was only mentioned in one source, so I don't know how true it actually is because it didn't say where the girls met or how they knew each other before the community center. So I really, I don't know here. But I did find that on IMD, there is like a short movie or a short like episode, I believe it's called Frenemies. And it talks about Jennifer and Angela's relationship. And I will put it right here so you guys can know what I'm talking about. All right, let's get back to the case. After Angela and Amber were done with Jennifer in the bathroom, Melvin and Ricky then guided Jennifer back out into the living room. And then Melvin poured a water bottle over Jennifer's head before Ricky then began to pour hot oatmeal all over Jennifer along with different spices. And Jennifer would cry out. She would say that her eyes are burning and that they really, really hurt. But these people, or better put monsters, did not care. They did not listen to her cries. After Ricky was done pouring hot oatmeal and spices all over Jennifer, he mocked her and said that she smelled bad and that she needed to shower. So Jennifer was allowed to go to the bathroom to shower. She completely showered and then she put her clothes back on. She was then directed to go to the living room by Ricky and Melvin, which she did. They forced her to take off all of her clothes and they threw them out of the window of the apartment. It was then that they put a sock in her mouth and they shaved off all of her hair. And while Ricky was present, Melvin Knight completely sexually assaulted and violated Jennifer. And it was after that that Angela and Amber finally came back and I don't know what type of medication Angela had, 
but apparently they gave a high dosage to Jennifer before they then all went to bed, and Jennifer was still left in the living room. The very next morning, Jennifer was still in the living room, and a dispute over soda occurred between Jennifer and Angela, and as a result of the dispute, Angela began to beat Jennifer, and out of self-defense, Jennifer just need Angela in the stomach. And then Angela reported to Ricky saying that Jennifer had killed her baby. But Angela was not pregnant. Ricky then said to Jennifer, if you want to kill my kid, then why should I let you live? It was then that Angela told Ricky to choose between her and Jennifer. And in response, Ricky called a family meeting, which essentially meant the entire Greensburg Six met in the living room to have a discussion on what they should do with Jennifer. And at this point, Jennifer was completely out of it. She had been drugged, beaten, and sexually assaulted all within the course of a few short hours. Somehow, the result of this meeting was them agreeing that Jennifer should drink Angela's urine. And when Jennifer refused initially and tried to gag and not take it, Angela then made up another concoction, which was a combination of urine and feces. And she made Jennifer drink it by continuing to beat her with a uh, with a towel rack and a crutch. Because she had to, Jennifer consumed this concoction and then vomited. Another part of Jennifer's torture is that they made her drink sleeping pills and antibiotics and a full thing of vegetable cooking oil as well as things like urine and nail polish and just all of these things that should not be ingested. It was after this that they decided to have another family meeting where they voted to kill Jennifer. And they did this, they voted this way because they didn't want Jennifer to report them and report what had happened to her. So before they killed her, they made Jennifer write a suicide note. And I will show a picture of it here. The first lines, the, the middle, I mean, the, the entire thing is horrible because in essence, it just says that she has not been happy for a while now and that everyone would be better off without her, which was just not the case at all. Jennifer was light and love to everyone who knew her and she brought so much joy. So for them to make her write these lies, it just, God, I... I wish, I really did wish that they all got the death penalty. Ricky and Melvin took Jennifer to the bathroom once again, but this time they had a knife and Melvin began to stab Jennifer and Ricky slit her wrists. After this, they bound her with Christmas lights and choked her to make sure that she was really gone. After Jennifer was deceased, they then held another meeting to decide what to do with the body and they decided to try to make her body look like a Christmas tree and shove her into a metal trash can, which they then placed outside near a truck in the snow near Salem-Greensburg Middle School, where she was discovered that very same day by a truck driver. Despite all of the horrors and atrocities that they put Jennifer through, after the body was discarded by the truck, the six of them went to bed. When an autopsy was performed on Jennifer, they concluded that she passed away due to everything that was done to her, the medications, the stabbings, the torture, but the final blow was ruled to be the stabbings. And the investigation and arrests happened very quickly and Melvin and Ricky were both given the death sentence and despite the fact that Angela instigated the entire thing and planned it and told them all what to do, because she was still a minor at 17 years old, they did not give her the death penalty. She was sentenced initially to life in prison without the possibility of parole, but a few years later that was changed and she is now eligible for parole when she is 78 years old. And mind you, right now, as of uh, 2023, Angela is 29 years old. And the rest of the Greensburg Six were given sentences ranging from 34 to 74 years. Melvin Knight's execution has been stayed a few times, or in other words, delayed, and it was signed off, and by signed off, I mean it was approved of last year in, I believe, August of 2022. But from everything that I've found, there is no definite date of execution for Melvin or a date of death. So I believe he is still in prison 
until he is executed, but because his execution was signed off, it should happen in the near future. And that is sadly the case of Jennifer Daugherty. I hope that she is resting in peace and that her family members over the years have started to feel peace and have gotten justice for her. If there are any other cases that you guys would like to see, feel free to comment below. And thank you guys for hearing Jennifer's story.